my back garden. Everything is driven by steam. I don't need electricity. The boiler produces the steam to drive three steam engines that work all of my workshop. But the drawback that is against an electric motor is the fact that, you know, you can't just press a button and start it off. It takes me roughly a day to get the whole place going. The only thing awful about belt-driven machinery is just at the crucial moment the belt breaks and the job stops. But it, it's very cheap. At one time it was full of steam engines round here, driving cotton mills and engineering workses and the likes. Now this must be the only steam-powered works in all of Bolton. Nearly 200 years, steam drove the wheels of industry, making Britain into the greatest industrial nation in the world. But it hadn't always been the case. Steam power didn't really cause the Industrial Revolution, but it played a very important part in it. The factory system were developed from the textile industry. All this was done a long time before the steam engine became fully developed. Quarry Bank Mill at Style is hidden away behind Manchester Airport. When the mill was first built in the latter half of the 18th century, they used water power to drive the new revolutionary spinning machinery. And it is without a doubt one of the very best places where you can see the steam engine and water power working together. The original water wheel was designed and built by Sir William Fairburn of Manchester who were very famous for his, what they call, suspension water wheels, which of course I rather think comes from the fact that they put the first segment in the bottom of the water wheel pit and anchor it to the spokes and it'll be suspended. Move it round one and put another in, move it round one and put another in, and eventually it'd end up round. When this water wheel was first installed, steam engines were quite well developed, but they were a, a bit unreliable. And of course, this thing runs for nothing all the trouble with breaking down and bringing coal and all that. It still was a formidable source of power, as you can see with the size of it, looking through these reduction gears behind me, you know, a lot of power there to drive all the machinery in the mill. Even today, the, the weaving shed takes its power from the water wheel, and this is part of the transmission. This great vertical shaft that comes up through three floors up to this level where the weaving shed is. And of course the bevel gears and then the horizontal shaft, and then the counter shafts and then the looms proper. Well, these things were always this great source of trouble. The great weight of a vertical shaft, especially in a spinning mill, which nearly always were four and five stories high, the great problem was getting the, the weight of each length of the vertical shaft, like equalised on like thrust burnings, and they never could quite get it right, and they always got hot at the bottom. And of course, once it got hot, the wall mill had to stop. Basically, the transmission and to the, from the water wheel comes up the shaft, up the vertical shaft. Then, of course, it's, it's transmitted into these long ones, which are called line shafts. In reality, these are not very long, you know. I mean, some of them in the olden days, when the torque started at one end, the other end didn't move for a bit till it actually twisted the shaft. There was such great weight on them. And, of course, they started off at the driven end quite thick. And by the time they'd gone the full length of the weaving shed, they, they kept stepping down a bit in diameter, you know, because of the twisting action. It became quite an art setting up line shafts. These things are called looms and spinning cloth with. The noise levels are terrific. Can you imagine what it must have been like with, in a room with 1,500 of these things? all going at the same time for 16 hours a day. The great problem with water wheels, they were very economical to run and all of that like, but there were one big problem. In times of drought, 
the work stopped and everybody had to go home. So they had to bring in another way to drive these machines. Steam power was only introduced, really, to help out the water wheel. Forward-thinking mill owners soon realised that it was a better form of power. In 1810, Samuel Gregg, the mill owner, installed a beam engine, not to be the main source of power, but to just to help out the water wheel in times of drought. In 1836, Mr. Gregg replaced his original engine with a Bolton and Watt beam engine of all of 20 horsepower. By the end of the 18th century, Bolton and Watt had taken the lead in steam engine technology. Up to this time, all the early engines, including Watts, could do nothing but pump water. But in the 1790s, because of the introduction of machines like these to the textile industries, a new type of engine was needed to power them. The early steam engines had been built using quite primitive methods. The blacksmith had done everything by eye as he banged away on his anvil, but all this was to change. Bolton and Watt worked everything out in advance with measured architectural style drawings for all the machines and the parts. It was really the beginning of the engineering industry as we know it. And in the archives of Birmingham City Libraries, they've got an interesting collection of Watt's papers and drawings, including some that related to an engine they built for a Manchester cotton mill. This is an agreement made between um, James Watt and Matthew Bolton. You can see there they've signed this. This is made with their customer, a man mm -hmm. called Peter Drinkwater, who was a Manchester mm -hmm. cotton mill mm -hmm. owner. Whilst Drinkwater was, was having the engine built and having the agreement mm -hmm. drawn up, he obviously decided that um, he needed more power for his cotton mm -hmm. mill. Originally, he asked them to build him a six horsepower engine, but he changed his mind mm -hmm. and decided he wanted more power. So they had to change um, the specification to eight horses, and you can see where they've incorporated the change into the agreement, yeah. Eight good horses. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Not, not eight weak horses, but eight yeah, yeah, good horses. Yeah. And of course, James Watt was the man who, who introduced the term mm. horsepower yeah. into engineering usage. And Bolton and Watt were very keen to define mm. exactly what their engines are being used for. So up here it sets out um, that the engine's being used for the uh, purposes of preparing and carding mm. cotton. Drink water has to apply to the said James Watt and Matthew Bolton for mm. their consent. Yeah, you were pretty st strict, weren't you, on, on all this tattle like? He was, he was indeed, and it was all yeah. to protect his patent. This is the actual drawing for the drink water engine for Manchester. All the alterations are marked on in red, and the interesting bit is where they decided to change it from a six horsepower one to an eight horsepower one. They put another couple of inches in the uh, diameter of the cylinder, right. haven't they? Yes, you can see they've, they've crossed out the original dimension of, of 14 mm. inches and increased mm. it to 16. To 16. Yeah, on the beam, they mm. were even telling you what sort of wood to make it yeah. out of. Seasoned, yeah. straight-grained young oak. And you can see here in the, in the, the spring beams across the top, mm. it's um, made out of yeah, deal, deal rather than yeah. oak, so mm. it's so much softer. The steam engine had arrived and it had a massive impact. The rapid rise in manufacturing completely altered the wall skyline. Pit headgears like this one at Beamish Altner Museum sprang up all over the skyline. And it wasn't very long that the mine owners and the coal owners realised that as well as pumping water, the steam engine could be used for lowering men down fast to get to the work quicker and of course bringing up the end product. Cage after cage of coal. Yeah, this is one of the earliest types of, of this winder. They were quite common in the northeast of England, sort of a, what's termed as a vertical steam winding engine, which of course in its time it would have brought literally millions of tons of coal up from the bowels of the earth in no doubt a cage with two decks and two tubs in each in each deck. You know, we may be five or six hundred weight in each tub every time. And of course it would wind the men up and down as well but sort of uh, a bit slower than what they want to call. 
The engine driver, he's got to get the coal coming up as fast as he could for the management. Coal production stored and the gaps got deeper and this enabled the manufacturers to install more steam engines and burn more coal and of course it's really what made Great Britain great. By the middle of the 19th century, the steam engine had been harnessed to nearly every industry that were around. It was cheap to run, it, it made manufacturing much easier, and of course, the Industrial Revolution had arrived. And it had a massive effect on the lives of ordinary working people as they began to move from the countryside to the new industrial cities. These were springing up close to the coal fields and the transport links that could get the raw materials to them. This is the Etruscan Bone and Flint Mill here in Stoke-on-Trent. And you might be wondering really what a bone and flint mill is. Well, crushed up bones and flints are one of the main ingredients in fine bone china. Here in Etruria, it were a centre of crushing bones and flints up to put fine bone china on the tables of the gentry. Inside, there's the trusty old beam engine. This one's a copy of a Bolton and Watt engine made in Salford in the 1820s. The drive shaft goes through the hole in the wall from the engine room to drive the machines. This is the other side of the hole in the wall and it's called the gear room. You can see why with these big cog wheels. And what happens in here really, it just spreads out the rotary motion of the beam engine on the other side into two great big long horizontal shafts. And then through these big bevel gears, it drives vertical shafts to the mixing pans upstairs. The vertical shafts came up from down below in the middle of these great pans and of course turned round these big paddles and mixed up the flint and the bone. But before they could be put in the pans, they had to be burned in two kilns downstairs and they added all the lot, poured in the water and set the thing in motion and the stones and the paddles turning all the lot round ground it into a beautiful white fine slurry. To make it all work, they had to have an efficient way of raising steam. This is what's known as a Cornish boiler, reputedly invented by Richard Trevithick in Cornwall. And that's why it's called a Cornish boiler. And basically, it's quite a simple thing. It's, a, it's an iron tube with two end plates in, and then there's another iron tube of a smaller diameter, which is this one here, which is termed as the fire tube, which goes from this end right through to the other end. And at the front end of this tube, behind these doors, the fire is lighted on the grate, and the products of combustion go around the end of the back of the boiler up there, and along the sides, and then finally goes up the chimney. So they utilise as much of the heat as they can out of the products of combustion on the fire. You only have a fire in here a few times a year, but at home I've got steam up most of the time. It's very important to know where the water level is, and of course, this particular bit of it here is the water gauge, and when you open this valve at the bottom, the steam pressure inside fires the water down, and of course, when you shut the valve, it's forced in at the bottom by the water pressure below the steam, and you can see it rise up again. A bit higher up, of course, is the pressure gauge, you know, which is a, a great clock with a steel spiral tube inside it that when it gets up to pressure or its pressure's rising, it works a, a quadrant and a rack and it, and it sort of registers on a needle the pounds upon the square inch that's in the boiler. The steam at the back that you can see issuing is not that the boiler's leaking, it's the safety valve. So we haven't got that, they do a blow up. Yeah, people don't realise really the like the power of steam. The, the, this boiler looks peaceful and tranquil and not making any funny noises. And there's only 75 pounds per square inch in it, other than being very hot. It's uh, it's like a potential bomb in a way. Uh, this is like a demonstration of what's inside, you know. Yeah, 
see all that pent up power inside. And of course, we all know in the olden days, there were lots and lots of boiler explosions where things went wrong. One day, a newspaper man came in here and, with his cameraman, you see, and, uh, and the cameraman said, you know, he said, he was getting on a bit, the cameraman, man. he said, when I was a lad and I worked for the Choyley Guardian, he said, the editor said, you get off to such a body's weaving shed, there's been an explosion. And he said, I set off down the road with my camera and arrived at this weaving shed to, to be greeted by an unbelievable scene of carnage and disaster. And in the weaving shed, which of course is mainly run by women, all the machinery and the line shafting started going round at a thousand miles an hour and everything was shaking, the whole works looked as though they were going to fall down. The governors on the engine had gone wrong, the engines building up revolutions that were going really, really fast. And two of them in the engine room, one of them says, I'll go and get the women out of the engine, out of the weaving shed. You go and see the engineer about getting the engine stopped. And the guy who were going to the engine house, halfway across the mill yard when the thing, the wall thing exploded, and he copped his lorry, he ended up dead. But the, the man in charge of the engine, he were turning the stop valve off on the engine and he just got it down to shut when the whole thing blew apart and all as it did would break his arm, you know, he survived. But bits of the engine were going through like Coronation Street type rooftops 500 yards away down the road, you know, unbelievable. And that were quite late on, about 1956 or something like that. But, in spite of the dangers, it was still a very efficient way of driving the wheels of industry, especially as steam engine technology moved on. By the middle of the 19th century, Bolton and Watts' rotated beam engine began to give way to this thing, the horizontal steam engine, and it's reputed that the first man to come up with the idea connecting the cylinder to the crankshaft in this fashion was Richard Trevithick. And along with a gentleman in Leeds called Matthew Murray, they developed the horizontal type of engine. And there were literally thousands of engines like this made from little teeny ones, three foot long, to the biggest one on record were made by a company in Bolton called Lick Hargreaves's. And reputedly the cylinder were 10 feet long. The horizontal steam engine was much easier to manufacture in all sizes and you didn't have to have a great big tall engine room to keep it in. To build an engine like this, all that you needed were a big lathe, a shaper and a good iron founder. And you could make one in a shed in back yard. I've more or less done it myself once or twice. As we all know that's the cylinder, that's the connecting rod, that's the crank pin, there's no bending or forging involved in it. It's a big iron bar for the crankshaft. The disc is a casting, and of course the flywheel is cast in two halves. It was a very efficient way of driving machinery. And as these engines got bigger and bigger, they could drive literally hundreds of machines on four or five floors of a mill or a factory. As steam began to replace water power, there were two things that were needed, like plenty of coal and, and a good transport system. And of course here, in a place like Wigan, where the coal stuck out the floor five foot thick nearly everywhere, it was the ideal place and it fast became a boom town. I suppose it'd be like anywhere else. During winter you wouldn't be able to see for the clouds of smoke that came out of the many great chimneys. I know all the mill owners and the pit owners all lived in country somewhere, in a nice mansion that they built out of the ill-gotten gains of the lads down below. The earliest factories only employed 20 or 30 people, but by the middle of the 19th century, they built great places like this behind me, which of course could do many different processes and employ literally hundreds of people. This is Trenchyfield Mill at Wigan Pier, and it houses one of the world's biggest surviving mill steam engines. William Woods built his mill here in 1907, it was a state-of-the-art spinning mill. Fireproof floors, five storeys high, and room for a thousand employees. And now I'm going to see if they'll let me play with the engine. This great engine behind me once drove all the machinery and on five floors, and it was built by John and Edward Woods of Bolton about 1907. 
and I'm going to have a do at making it go. You know, you've got to turn this great valve and hopefully all the connecting rods will be in the right shop and it'll set off. Here we go. Mm. Mm. <laughs> a bit stiff on the valve. You know. This engine is what's known as a tandem cross compound, triple expansion. It's got four cylinders, and in the small ones comes the high pressure steam. And of course, it's exhausted into a receiver, and then it goes into the low pressure ones, which are the big ones. And when it had the grand opening, each side of the engine were christened. One side's called Lena, and one side's called Ellen. And they were the daughters of the engineering company that built them. And it's 2,500 horsepower. fantastic isn't it really the size of the bits and pieces you know like you think about your mammod at home and you've got a connecting rod like that which must be about weigh about maybe three tons uh, incredible piece of tackle uh, they did things in a grand style this particular part of the building is called the rope race and of course the reason for that is obvious that the ropes are all racing round and there would be as many as four or five to each floor and all together on the drum i think there's 55 grooves and the drum weighs 70 tons that's one hell of a wheel in it in the days when these things were run commercially this place were quite a frightening place to be because there's a lot of daylight now shining in here but when it was full of rope, all going in different directions and bouncing, you know, it was quite, quite frightening. The only time they could mend them were in the middle of the night, you know, the rope splicer had to come in the middle of the night because they never did many night shifts at Cotton Mill and splice a new rope, brand new piece, two inches diameter, made of cotton. The industrialization of the great cities put a terrible strain on the antiquated water and sewage systems. Many new reservoirs had to be built and of course to pump water to them, many new pumping stations had to be built. This is one of the more ornate. Papelwick, built in 1884, pumped water to the city of Nottingham all the way through till 1969. These are the six Lancashire boilers that made the steam to drive the pumping engines. They were made in Manchester by W and J Galloway. Mr Galloway improved the Lancashire boiler by inserting vertical water tubes at the end of the fire tubes, which greatly increased the steaming capabilities. And down here they used to burn five tonnes of coal a day on three of them. The, the, the other three were on standby. They always did things like that at Waterworks, it's just in case. And the pressure's getting a bit low now, so... Come on, Jeff. Well, I've, I've done one side, Fred, so if you mm. fire right. this side... Right. These two double-acting beam engines are thought to be the last two that James Watt and Company ever made. And they pump 1.5 million gallons of water a day from a well 200 feet deep. And then a further 
elevation of another 100 feet and then it went by gravity to all the way to Nottingham. Although these engines were built in 1881, they still use the rather old-fashioned Cornish principle, which of course proves what how successful and economical the Cornish beam engines were and how they lent themselves to pumping water. It's interesting that by this time, James Watt and Company had, had reverted to using high-pressure steam. And of course, something that James Watt himself once said years before, that Richard Trevithick should be hung for using high-pressure steam because of its danger. That lovely noise takes me back a bit. I remember as, as a lad of about 16 or 17, rather full of fear, climbing up the engine house steps and looking at the, the thing going round through the window and seeing the engine minder in an easy chair was snoozing. But he wouldn't really be asleep, he'd be listening for any strange change in the, the pattern of noise that were coming from the thing, which of course denoted something were going wrong. These great beams transfer the power from the piston rod to the pump rods down the, down the well or the shaft. They weigh 13 tonnes apiece. Have you ever wondered how they got them up here? Because there were no fancy cranes in them days. There's lots of lovely old fashioned pictures exist with great piles of great box of timber and they're, they're basically jacking up the beam as the engine room came up and then they used to slide them in over the top of the central beam that they pivot on and the hangers in the roof really weren't for lifting the whole thing up they were just for lifting one end up and maybe replacing a bearing when the engines and the building were finished they were well under budget and with all the money they had left over they did all these wonderful embellishments like the stained glass windows and the terracotta bits outside and the fish and the birds and everything. It's rather sad really that general, the general public never saw any of this, you know, it was only like the waterworks superintendents and maybe some of the operatives, you know. But it really shows you how proud the Victorians were of their engineering achievements. From the Industrial Revolution back to the Stone Age in Alan Titchmarsh's Natural History of the British Isles, next on BBC Two.